Hi, uh, so this is Dr. Watson again, and we're going to pick up our conversation of interest groups and focus this time uh, on the actual tactics that interest groups use to try to influence policy. Okay. So um, there are a number of ways <laughs> that interest groups attempt to influence policy. Um, one is through sort of directly, going directly to members of Congress, going directly to administrative agencies in the White House, um, going directly to Austin and talking to members of the state legislature. Um, and this is called lobbying. Um, we'll talk about it a little more in a second. Um, that lobbying can happen in person. It can also, of course, happen electronically um, through emails, et cetera. Um, and sometimes interest groups uh, strategically participate in hearings. Um, you may have, over the last few months, been watching uh, the hearings that are going on with respect to the January 6th uh, riots from 20. 20, or I'm sorry, from January of 2021, um, those sorts of hearings actually take place all the time. Congress is constantly holding hearings um, to learn about issues before they make laws what, during the legislative process. And interest groups sometimes go to testify before Congress in an effort to um, provide information. Um, interest groups also sometimes lobby indirectly. So that can take the form of using the public, like using the people to try to um, sort of get at government or by participating in elections. And again, we'll talk about each of these um, in a little more detail. Um, incidentally, the image on this page is a street sign for K Street, which is in Northwest Washington, DC, um, right near Georgetown um, along the Potomac River. Um, the reason that I have a picture of K Street here is that there are actually a fair number of companies, firms that lobby um, professionally. So in so an interest group may have lobbyists who work for that interest group. So for example, the NRA. The NRA is huge and they do so much lobbying. There are lobbyists who work for the NRA and they don't work for anybody else and all they do is lobby for the NRA. But smaller organizations or organizations that have um, you know, more diverse uh, agendas um, may not have anybody on staff who has access in DC. And so there are firms that are sort of like law firms, right? Um, that you can hire to lobby for your group. Um, and many of those firms have their offices on K Street. Um, so if you talk, if you hear somebody in DC talking about oh, those people on K Street, they're talking about lobbyists. Okay. So direct lobbying. Um, again, this image is of a guy looking very worried and it says lobbyists because it's hard for politicians to decide stuff on their own. Um, and that is absolutely correct, right? Imagine you're a politician. You've just been elected to the House District. Um, you've taken Michael Burgess's seat, surprise. Um, so you're, you're in DC now and oh my gosh, you are now expected to vote on legislation on health care, the environment, foreign policy, finance, technology, the criminal justice, civil justice, regulation of the tobacco industry. You have to like make decisions about this huge array of subjects and most of them, you probably don't know anything about them. Um, so lobbying on the one hand, lobbyists are trying to get stuff that they want. They're trying to get the policies that they want, but they actually do provide politicians with real information that can help those politicians make good decisions. Um, for example, I worked for a lobbying firm um, just for a summer on K Street. Um, 
many years ago. And uh, one of our clients was um, uh, Citizens for a Free Kuwait. Actually, they were our clients before I got there. So I, was, I did not work on this project. Um, but Citizens for a Free Kuwait was the uh, name of the Kuwaiti government in exile. So when Saddam Hussein from Iraq invaded Kuwait and sort of annexed it, took it over, um, the members of the Kuwaiti government fled uh, Kuwait, of course, because otherwise they would have been killed. And they got together and they hired Helen Knowlton, the company that I worked for, um, to lobby for them in front of Congress to try to get the US government to intervene in that conflict. Um, and that process included testimony in front of various congressional um, hearings where members of the organization, people who had actually fled Kuwait, talked about what had happened to them so that there was public record. But they also went door to door um, and talked privately to members of Congress to tell their stories. Um, and they provided information that members of Congress otherwise just would not have had about what happened um, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, like what actually happened, what were the effects on the people who lived in Kuwait, et cetera. Now, obviously they're only providing one side of the story. Um, they are providing the position of relatively wealthy Kuwaitis, um, but it was information that turned out to be important to Congress and ultimately helped persuade them to enter into um, the first Iraq war. So when we think of what interest groups do, when we think about lobbying, typically what we think about is direct lobbying. Um, again, this is when you go door to door, right? A lobbyist and his client literally walk the halls of Congress, and try to make appointments, but sometimes they just knock on doors and they talk to either um, the members of Congress themselves, or they talk to their senior staff members, and they provide them with information. Um, another one of our clients was um, a Canadian steel company, um, or consortium, it was a group of Canadian steel companies, and they wanted to lobby Congress to lower tariffs on Canadian steel. And um, when they were doing this door-to-door process, you know, my boss, Gary, was walking around the halls of Congress with these Canadians, and um, they went, uh, one of the groups that they really wanted to hit up were members of Congress from Minnesota, because Minnesota has a huge steel industry, uh, iron mining, and so in theory, mem members of Congress from Minnesota should want high steel tariffs. So they're trying to convince them to do things that are against the wishes of their constituents. And one of the things that they talked to them about was the issues of getting guides for fishing trips in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. Um, it was something that a couple of members of Congress were really very interested in. They wanted to know how they could sort of facilitate and make it easier for them to go fishing and kind of suggested that if the Canadian Steel Consortium could make it easier for them to go fishing, they might be amenable to reducing those tariffs. It's a little shady, um, but as long as it's not tit for tat, it's okay. Legally, not ethically, but legally. Um, so again, this direct lobbying can be door to door. It can be testimony in front of Congress, again, providing um, information. One of the nice things there is that then it's public record. So if members of Congress want to persuade their constituents, like, hey, this is why I made this decision, having the testimony on the record is very helpful. Um, and again, that lobbying can also be digital. More and more it is. It's not just legislatures, it's also executive agencies. Again, that can be face-to-face, -face, that can be participating in the rulemaking process that uh, bureaucracies undertake, um, and providing significant levels of expertise. Because again, members of Congress and even members of bureaucratic agencies don't know everything. And so 
when members of the pharmaceutical industry come and lobby the FDA, they explain like, here's how this drug works. Here's who it's going to help. Here's the number of people that have this illness that we're trying to treat. And that's information that's really helpful for the FDA to have. Again, it may be biased information, but if members of Congress or members of the FDA can be critical enough, right, and really think about where the information is coming from, it can also then be useful. Okay, indirect lobbying <clears throat> is a little bit different. Instead of going to members of Congress or going to political officials and saying, please change policy, indirect lobbying is sort of any other way <laughs> that you might try to make it more comfortable for members of Congress to support your position than to not support your position. So this can take the form of electioneering. Um, electioneering is participating in the electoral process. Remember, interest groups do not run candidates. They don't, there's no candidate for the NRA on the ballot, but the NRA absolutely does endorse some candidates and not others. The NRA <laughs> you will provide um, members of Congress with what's called a report card saying, you know, this, this member of Congress gets an A from us, they're very pro-gun rights, this one gets a C, they're kind of on the fence, and this one gets an F. This person, you know, this member of Congress is very anti-gun. Um, or they will provide sample ballots to people saying, here, if you want to vote for the pro-gun candidates, here's who you should vote for. Um, so those endorsements can be incredibly powerful. They can also make contributions. Um, they can make some contributions to political action committees that then turn around and make contributions directly to candidates. But most of the time, interest groups prefer to do their make their donations indirectly, right? Then they have a lot more control. So a super PAC um, is uh, a mechanism for influencing, uh, for basically running ads that support one candidate or the other, but they're ads that are not actually run by the candidate, right? So um, super PACs are able to um, create their own media that influences the election. They just can't coordinate with the candidates themselves. Um, sometimes they be, interest groups will be a little more subtle and they will engage in issue advocacy. So instead of talking about specific candidates, they will simply talk about the issues. Um, usually there is a suggestion about which candidate is right on the issue and which candidate is wrong on the issue, but not always. Um, again, going back to, to my own experiences in a lobbying firm, one of our, um, one of our clients um, was an organization that promoted research into spinal injuries. And the company that I worked for worked with them to get a couple of really high profile people to join their cause, um, specifically Christopher Reeve, who'd had a spinal cord injury, and Gloria Stefan, uh, who's a singer, she had also had a spinal cord injury. And um, then they created a whole series of ads to sort of explain why it was important to provide federal financial support for research in this particular area. They didn't talk about specific candidates, but they informed the public that this is an issue on the political agenda that maybe they should be thinking about. Um, in addition, another way to participate in electioneering is through something called grassroots support. Um, and this is when you go to your membership. 
So instead of just endorsing a candidate, for example, um, you go to your membership and you say, here is an email, send this to your representative. Here is a letter. Here's the script for a phone call. Call your member of Congress and say this to them, right? So you're basically putting your membership to work. You're putting the rank and file of your group, the average citizens to work so that members of Congress or members of the government can see how much public support you have. They can see in advance, oh, these are the votes that I might either gain or lose, depending on how I come down on this particular issue. Um, <clears throat> grassroots support um, is, is, is sort of authentic mobilization of your membership. Um, again, through getting them to write letters, getting them to make phone calls, um, or staging rallies, right? Staging big marches so that again, members of Congress or members of the government can see very visually, look at all those voters. Holy moly, I probably want those voters on my side, right? It could be very effective. There are other related strategies that are similar to grassroots mobilization, but are a little bit sneakier. Um, there's something called grass tops mobilization. This is where you don't get every member of your group to write a letter to their senator, but instead you target individual members of your group who have influence. Right, so maybe you're the NRA and you know that you have a member in Dallas who's a good friend of Michael Burgess. So you call up this member and you say, hey, next time you have dinner with Michael Burgess, would you talk to him about this particular issue? Would you make that call on our behalf, right? So you're not necessarily mobilizing all of your people, regular voters. Instead, you're mobilizing members of your group that have an in, that have particular influence, either because they're very wealthy and could be donors, or they're friends with people in high places, or they run businesses that are important um, to a member of Congress's community, um, but somebody who's got a little bit of, of push. Then there's something called astroturfing. I just love that expression. Um, if you're familiar with astroturf, you know that it's fake grass, right? It's not real grass at all. So astroturfing is the process of creating the illusion that you have this mass mobilization behind you, that you have all of this voter support, when in reality, you do not. Um, in the modern time, right, the modern time, that makes me sound like I'm a pioneer woman. Um, in the, our most contemporary elections, one of the most prominent ways to engage in astroturfing, which is kind of shady, honestly, is through the use of sock puppets. And um, so you have like two members in your group, right? It's not a big group. It's not an interest group with thousands and thousands of members. It's two guys in their basement but they've created thousands of fake online identities and those fake online identities all post on Facebook or all tweet about a particular issue. So from the outside, it looks like there's this mass mobilization when in reality it's not, but the illusion can be very effective. So astroturfing is creating the appearance of having a lot of public support when in reality you do not. Okay. Another strategy that some interest groups use, um, which is increasingly common, is going through the courts. Um, the courts, particularly the federal courts, but also state courts, um, actually do make policy. Um, the courts are able, for example, to strike down legislation that is unconstitutional 
or to mandate that the government do certain things because of constitutional requirements. And as a result, they can influence policy. There are three primary ways that interest groups can be involved in litigation strategies. Um, the most involved is through a test case, kind of the mid-range is through sponsorship, and then the, the most um, or the least in, intrusive or the least expensive is by serving as what's called an amicus curiae. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So a test case exists when an interest group decides we want to challenge this policy in the courts and we are going to go out and we're going to find people who are willing to sue the government and we are going to walk them through the whole process. We are going to be there from beginning to end. Um, probably the best known example of a test case is Brown versus Board of Education, um, which you're probably familiar with. Brown versus Board of Education came about um, when many school districts were formally segregated. Um, black students and white students were sent to separate schools, um, and that was by law. Um, so the NAACP, which is a, a very powerful, very effective interest group, um, they wanted to challenge the notion of segregated schools as being unconstitutional suggesting that they that segregated schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. So they went out and they found <laughs> people who had children, but Black families that had children that went to segregated schools who wanted their children to go to integrated schools. Um, and so in particular, they found the Brown family. Um, they, there were other families involved in this litigation. Brown versus Board of Education was one of several cases that all kind of came up at the same time. But the Brown family was um, in Topeka, Kansas, and the Browns were just kind of a picture perfect family. They were super wholesome, um, you know, mom and dad, both employed, adorable children. They were like the people you wanted to put on a poster, right? They were a lovely, wonderful family. So they were chosen both because they were willing to kind of put themselves out there. Um, it was potentially dangerous to identify um, as, as being pro-civil rights and, and possibly incur the wrath of white supremacist groups. Um, so this was no small matter, um, but also they were a, a family that the NAACP hoped would engender sympathy, right? Um, they wanted to make sure that they had a, a great family, right? Um, the District of Columbia versus Heller was a, a Second Amendment case. Again, the NRA was there from the beginning. Right, and they found somebody to sue the district uh, to sue Washington D.C., um, who had just like kind of the perfect situation to make them an excellent plaintiff in the case. Um, so test cases are strategically planned litigation, where the plaintiffs are recruited both for their willingness to be a test case, but also because they are good plaintiffs, right? They are sympathetic plaintiffs. Their situation factually is just kind of perfect for the arguments that the interest group wants to make. They are poster children. Okay. Case sponsorship is a little less involved. Um, with case sponsorship, the litigation starts and an interest group steps in and says, you know what? We feel very strongly that you ought to win this case. We feel very strongly that um, this is a good policy and we're willing to provide you with outstanding attorneys <laughs> who will work for you for free. And um, you just have to let us direct the, the sort of proceedings, right? Um, a classic example of case sponsorship is uh, U.S. versus Windsor, 
uh, which was a challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, uh, uh, Edie Windsor um, had been married to her wife, uh, Thea Spire. They were married in Canada. They went to Canada to get married. They were US citizens, but they went to Canada to get married because same-sex marriage was legal in Canada before it was married, legal in the US. But then they moved back to the US and uh, Thea Spire actually passed away. And Edie Windsor sought to receive her social security benefits as her surviving spouse and was denied those benefits under the Defense of Marriage Act which said that the federal government would not recognize same-sex marriage. And so Edie Windsor brought a lawsuit and um, I believe it was the ACLU or it might've been Lambda, but I think it was the ACLU, um, saw this litigation and was like, Edie Windsor's a great plaintiff and she's already filed the lawsuit. She's already shown she's willing to do this we will step in, we will provide her with counsel, we will take this case as far as we can take it. And um, ultimately, uh, Edie Windsor was, was successful in her litigation. The last way that interest groups can use the courts is by serving as what are called amicus curiae. Um, amicus curiae literally means friend of the court. And um, you can file an amicus brief if you are not a party to litigation, right? You're not the person suing, you're not the person being sued. So you're not directly involved in the dispute, but you care about the outcome. And maybe you have information that would be useful to the court in making a good decision. Um, amicus briefs are the cheapest way for an interest group to participate in litigation. Litigation is a very expensive strategy. Attorneys are expensive, especially good ones. Um, but an amicus brief, you know, can cost anywhere from 50,000 to 250,000, which sounds like a ton of money, but compared to these other litigation strategies, it is, it is not. Um, so typically an amicus joins a particular side, says, I'm going to file an amicus brief in support of Edie Windsor, right? Or I'm going to file a, an amicus brief in support of the Brown family. Um, in the alternative, you can file a sort of purely informational brief where you're not really backing one side or the other, but you're like, look, I'm a scientist and I understand this very technical thing that's at the heart of this case. And so I just wanna make sure the court knows the real story with respect to the science here. Um, amicus briefs <clears throat> can be extraordinarily influential. There is a lot of research on the effect that amicus briefs have. Um, they increase the likelihood that a case will be heard by the Supreme Court. There's lots of evidence that the courts will borrow um, reasoning, borrow ideas, borrow citations from amicus briefs and use them in their opinions. So they clearly read them and take them into consideration. Um, there may be one or two amicus briefs in a case. There may be none, right? Some cases don't really attract that kind of attention or there may be hundreds. Um, abortion cases, for example, tend to get lots of amicus briefs. The American Medical Association files one, the American Psychological Association files one, um, the National Federation of Churches always files one. Um, <laughs> there are National Right to Life files one, the ACLU files, uh, like everybody wants to get in on the action when it's an abortion case. Um, death penalty cases often have a lot of amicus briefs, sometimes filed by other states. So for example, maybe an inmate in Oklahoma sues over the death penalty protocol in Oklahoma, but it's the same protocol they use in Texas. So the attorney general for Texas files an amicus brief to say, hey, we care about how this turns out also right? What you decide about Oklahoma is going to affect us too. Um, so amicus briefs are, again, a kind of a lower cost way to make the position of your group known to the courts. 
and to have a, a fairly sizable impact. Okay, so again, just kind of to recap, interest groups can largely either go directly to people in power, direct lobbying through testimony, door-to-door -door, um, lobbying, that sort of thing. They can go indirectly by electioneering, by grassroots mobilization, by running issue ads, by grass tops mobilization, by astroturfing. Um, so sort of kind of come at it from the back door or sometimes they go through the courts. Okay, um, that's gonna wrap this up and I will talk to you all again later.